Hi guys, this is Cindy and Michael from Part Time Permies. And give us a sound check if you can let us know that right away. But let's go see who's in the chat room. We're starting a couple minutes early, but um, let's see here. We have Incense Shop. You can go back and forth. Reading? Um, yes. Oh, Incense Shop, hello. Kara Murray. Your mom. <laughs> Tina's in the room. And second half homestead. And Tracy Collins. Let's see. Linda Taylor is comes back weekly yeah. nearly. Yeah. And MG Ibarra. I think you might be new. Welcome. And Noah's Ark. Long, Noah's. long time. Long time on here. A white picket fence just arrived. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yep. Um, and I think that's everybody who's chatting so far. So Welcome, you guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we do have, we did have a busy morning today. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope everybody had a good 4th of July. We actually had a busy morning on the 4th of July. Yeah, we took it fairly. We didn't go anywhere or do no. anything. We didn't do anything. Well, we didn't do anything special celebration-wise really yeah. on the 4th. I had to work on the 5th. So we didn't even. I had to work on the 5th. Yeah, we both had to work on the 5th. And. Then stay up that later. We went to bed like nine thirty or we tired. Maybe before ten. Yeah, because we we butchered three roosters that have been hanging around too long doing nothing. Just, nothing <laughs> just eating food. Yeah, uh, just costing money. Uh, so we we butchered three chickens. Did a hurry up on those. Yeah, and then I cut our lawn. Um, yeah, and I weed whacked for the first time all year because. Uh, did all the fence lines and around a few of the trees and things and just cleaned a few things up because we thought we were getting to a dry point and then we got a whole bunch more rain. Not as much as previous, but it's continuing to get hot afternoon showers. Yeah, we've been like upper 80s, low 90s, hot and humid, hot and humid. afternoon scattered rain showers, thunder showers, pop up downpours Today at we times. did not, but for the last yes. four or so days. It's Today the like, humidity broke a little bit, which is really yeah. nice. It's still in the 80s. Yeah, so we did a few things around the house. Fourth of July, um, I quick cooked up some bratwurst, mm -hmm. and we had some... And Puddin says she's a German dog. Yeah. <laughs> we had some raw, raw sauerkraut, and I happened mm -hmm. to have some sort of a coleslaw from earlier, so we had Double some cabbage. Of that, and I made some warm... <laughs> Real quick, made some warm German potato salad. Yeah, that was good. That was so, very yeah, good. Yeah, we just kind of threw that together. So that was really the only thing special, and we just kind of like a yeah. Saturday-ish, you know, getting yeah. some stuff done. Got some stuff done in the morning, relaxed more in the afternoon when it was hot. Um, our AC is broken, so we've been opening the windows at night and shutting them during the day. Somebody's coming on Tuesday. The regular guy's finally available yeah. once we got yeah. through the, the week. So yes. They'll be out and see if it's going yeah. to something small. Yeah, and Green Gables is in the room, by the way. Hello, and Claire Burke. Hello, hello. Um, some more people entering in. Um, so yeah, we were busy on the fourth. Hope everyone else had a good fourth. Let us know if you did anything fun and special here. Um, today, well, yesterday we had market day, so market day tends Market's to just be busy. I'm out. I'm out for 12, 12 hours before I even get home. By the yeah. time I get up, make food. Load, load market, do market, unload market. I'm deep 12 or 13 hours in. Yeah. By, so. by 3.34 when I'm <laughs> maybe got stuff back down yeah. into storage. Yeah. So we didn't get a whole lot done yesterday other than the market, which two markets. Um, and then I did take a broody chicken out of the chicken coop and moved her into our nursery tractor and was hoping she'd stay broody this time because last time it broke her broodiness and she seems to be, so I will be giving her some eggs probably tonight, which means she'll be hatching them right around Hoot Nanny. Three weeks. Mm -hmm. That should be fine because she'll, it usually takes a day or so to hatch them. She won't be off the nest much. Um, but yeah, that'll be fun to come back and get some chicks. Um, Red gravy with hot Italian sausage. I don't know. That's I like, like mixing and matching food. red gravy and Italian sausage. It sounds good, <laughs> but I mean, because red gravy is like Texas, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of, ever, I don't know. I can't remember good. the origin, but I want to say it's possibly Texas. Um, the red it's gravy. called fusion, isn't it? Yeah. Italian <laughs> sausage is always good. Yeah. Weird thing is here, well, it's not weird. 
the bratwurst tend to be pretty good around here because there's yeah. a lot of Polish. It's, of course, Chicago has a lot of Italian. A lot of German. Uh, a lot here. of German. So the, it's here Polish sausage and kilba smoked kielbasa. Yeah. All those things are predominant. On the East Coast, it was really good Italian sausage. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you when you switch locations, neither one can do the other one very well on a, at least going into the regular store or wherever. They're, they're all okay, but... Uh, they're not, it's not the same here. I make my own Italian sausage for the most part, and mm -hmm. it's just so much better than, than what the average one, because it, it seems like it's the same butcher shops and, and, you know, meat plants are doing the same. They're just changing the spices, but they're not as, yeah. not as on top of it sometimes. Linda says she's lost AC also. A deer mouse chewed through the wires. Yeah, you are saying that last week, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and well, wires should be pretty easy to repair, I mean, in one way. Sure. Replace them, yeah. As soon as you, you know where they go. And Claire went to Tennessee to see her grandbabies. Um, and Grammy Karen's in the room. Hello, I didn't see you come in. Took um, our Polaris Razor to an off-road park in mm -hmm. Kentucky. Wow, and there are a That's lot far. of ATVs moving here. around the road. There's a lot of dunes this, to this go weekend. Here. Yeah, we because we're cl not far from the dunes, and then you go upstate and yeah. forth. So. Michigan is a huge ATV state. Green Gables, how many days to hatch? It's 21 days average for chickens. Now, some hatch early, some hatch slightly late, but average tends to be about 21 days. I found if it's a main main flock girl, so one of our larger girls going broody, it's usually about 21 days because they tend to get up off the nest a little more often. The silkies will stay on the nest for two, three days without getting up to eat or do anything. And we'll just get up every two or three days to take care of themselves. But they tend to hatch in like 19 days, I find, even if they have, you know, full size eggs. So they tend to hatch a day or two early. Um, but that's just, I don't know, that the silkies are known for going broody as well and sitting, sitting nice and usually not pecking at you. Although I hear, uh, who was it, Tina that had a silky who was pecking at her when she went broody? Um so. Sausage and pepper. That's interesting. I learned to make sausage and peppers three different ways in New York. Uh, because you have um, you have like the sort of in a brothy with some uh, basil and, and such and the peppers. It's very just kind of brothy. I learned to make it with like some red wine. And then we did a red wine and to heavy tomato paste and really cooked it down into a pasty. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, and then you can, so you can kind of do it natural and just cook it straight down. You can cook it down with wine and herbs and things, or you can cook it down with red wine or red wine tomato paste. So there's three or four ways. And then I learned how to make, um, like for, in the New York style hot dogs, they do this, um, onions that are in sort of a slightly tomato-y, like Tabasco-y, um, sauce. What was that? I don't know. Something just banged against our garage wall. Maybe that was my market tent I set up. Did it you have, lean it on the... It's leaning. It probably shifted. Uh, go check on what banged against our wall. Grammy Karen, we just went over the fourth. For us, it wasn't anything too celebration-wise. We butchered roosters in the morning and did yard work and... It might have shifted. I'm okay. Sure. <laughs> Loud bangs in the room next door. Dude, so And had sick. good food. It had... Yeah, we grilled some stuff. Um, yeah, so Linda says East Coast was kibasa. <clears throat> now that in Indiana it's brats. Yeah, Indiana has a lot of Pol like my parents were down around the South Bend area and huge Polish communities and Eastern European. So yeah, yeah, brats, uh, but also the kibasa. They they dominate uh, this this. She area. said it was East. It was in the East. It was kibasa huh, right there. It was that's brats. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, love sausage, peppers, onions. Uh, yeah, we had some good food tonight too, but we'll get to that. Um, insurance finally taking care of the two ACs at the church that the lightning killed. Oh yeah, no! Yeah, that, that if you have decent insurance and it's a lightning strike, it will take care of all those. Yeah. Electronics that decided to pop. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes, um, we'll go over. We'll come back to food a little bit. Can't eat. Brats, they taste good, but God bless. Yeah, the fatty foods. The high are, fat can be yeah. hard and give people sometimes indigestion and, and things. Or, well, or the just, spice. The gallbladder yeah. 
uh, does not do well with fatty foods if there's gallstones yeah. and such. And a good sausage is typically 30% fat. Yes. Under 25% fat, it's crumbly, no good. So yeah. you're, you're just, you know, there's, you, well, now you can do some of the vegetable replacers and actually hmm. you can cut some of it. There's some pretty, because they create moisture um, yeah. and chew and they don't dry out so much. But so you can actually cut a 50 50 hmm. um, with a meat replacer and with meat, and it's not that bad. So. Hi, Carrie. She cleaned a bunch of goat water troughs on the fourth. <laughs> Farm chores. Yes, we did farm chores too. Um, and oh, and we did get a video up this week. Earlier this week, for those of you guys who missed, we did do gender reveal video. Um, it's only about seven minutes. It does go into a little bit of my uh, niece's suggestion on name as well, which was funny. Uh, I thought it was funny. It was cute. But um, so if you guys are interested in that video, uh, it was basically taking our reveal to our families mm -hmm. and putting it, mixing it up into that video. So that was a lot of fun. Um, for those of you guys who missed that this week, that was, I think, released on Tuesday. I think I got it out a day earlier than I was say, said I was going to. Yeah, um, you're going to do it either Tuesday or Thursday. Was the I was going to do Wednesday or Friday because Thursday was 4th of July. Oh, that's what I mean. Yeah, we're trying to yeah. get around 4th of July. Yeah. I know that. So I was going to do Wednesday or Friday, Thursday. and I ended up doing it on Tuesday. So, And I do have another video almost done that I will release this week on our spring uh, garden progression because I haven't edited much on the spring garden, so, and I do have some various videos that we've put together on that. So that will be coming soon. Um, should we think of names that start with a P? So it goes with part-time permies because oh. it's all peas and part-time permies. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know many names that start with a P that I like. I mean, there are some that are okay, but I mean, as far as really yeah, that know. strike me, I don't know. I'd have to look at it, um, think about it. Yeah, uh, sooner than you thought it would be. Yes. Okay. Um, Yep, Graham and Karen, you're gonna have to go watch it. Uh, and then Bobblehead made a yes! big deal on his channel. That was awesome. We, Cindy's been following him, and I follow him a for a long bit time since, since really the beginning. Yeah, I mean, before we, he moved, we started at about the same time. We both had. He was just reviewing channels when you started. Yeah, watching he him. was just reviewing channels, and I started watching him. He was probably about three or four months into his channel reviewing other channels before he had his property. And he was told to do that by Dan at Grassfed Homestead. In the meantime, um, about the same time, I had asked Dan, and we were applying to be on the farm tour, and I had asked Dan at Grassfed, you know, could you, you know, give us tips on our channel and stuff um, if you have some time? So he was actually our first subscriber. So it was actually kind of multiple connections. And then Bobbleheads was friends with Pratt. So, yeah, there was a lot of multiple connections that we're making mm -hmm. at the same time. So we kind of grew together and then he's completely outgrown us with his, but he posts a lot more often than I do. So, um, yeah, Jeff, we haven't seen him for a while. Funny thing is I ran into a, a school mate from college yesterday across from a gas pump. So randomly I hadn't seen in over 20 years. And she saw me and recognized me, yeah. which really surprised me. Yeah, across. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was like right at a Costco gas pump. We were next. With multiple. Right across from each other, which would have never happened if we hadn't basically pulled up at the same time. Right. It was really busy on a Saturday after market, and she called out my name, and I looked, and she told me who she was, and I looked, and I knew right away at that yeah. point, but I would have not <clears throat> necessarily recognized her, yeah. let alone you don't always see who's at the pump. But the funny part of that is, I had checked her Facebook to send her because, you know, when you're in the line at Costco, like, got to go because yeah. there's six people deep. You can't hang out and, um, and block the entire yeah, traffic. Yeah, and so I had went to go find her Facebook so I could text yeah. her and um, and saw that she knows Jeff. They live in the, basically in a relatively the same area. Um, I've never heard of that one. Other Pars food or flowers. Parsnipia. <laughs> Other food or flowers. <laughs> that start with a P. Um, Petunia is a pretty old-fashioned one. Yes. Old-fashioned name. But, sorry, I got distracted. People are throwing out P names. Penelope, Phyllis, uh, Polly, 
Petra. Yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, Jeff was, by the way, going back to that, Jeff was actually, he went on for like probably over a minute at the beginning of his video. That was kind of cool. So anyway, um, <laughs> your bill was born on 6666 huh. <laughs> at 666 in the me. morning. Oh, sorry. S Cindy and my mom share the same birthday, birthday of the not year, but obviously not year. <laughs> I guess not. Uh, but yeah, so we've been running into a bunch of mm -hmm. old friends and stuff. So what do we do this morning? Well, we quickly moved the chickens. Yes, we did move the chickens. Got them onto some fresh ground. And then we had fun at Lake Michigan. Um, we found a dog, couple dog beaches, actually. We went to one of them on Lake Michigan, the way you can take your dogs down to the beach and walk them uh, although lake michigan is so high you can see that so i think it's up about three feet yeah and when you think about an inland lake going up three feet that's kind of through this the year can happen quite easily yeah lake michigan going up three feet that's it's a that's huge. a lot of water that's massive so we're at uh at or around 1986 was the last time it was this high yeah it's around a modern day record for survey said it's a record but you're right off the top of a cliff so clearly it's not a full on record because the cliff was a water line at some time. Yeah. But it, it is very high. Um and so a lot of the beaches are minimally beached. Yep. So there so. used to be a lot more beach here, but you can see the grasses start up um pretty close. So the waves were pretty much going up to the grasses and eat away at the grasses. But uh Michigan yeah. is Michigan is a soft sand, brown sand beach, by the way. On Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan on this side, yes, um, especially down in the lower portion here because but of up the prevailing, in the, you also and, yeah, the, uh, yeah, Sleeping Bear Dunes and stuff up north, yeah, and, and up north, and then when you get yeah. around the corner, it can get a little rockier, but uh, the prevailing winds push all that the sand. sand onto this side and take it away from the Illinois side, not Illinois, well, barely Wisconsin more well, than Wisconsin Illinois. Too, but you do have Illinois a little bit, actually, if we go back to... Yeah. So they're rocky on that side. That picture behind me somewhere is Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Way across the water behind me is Chicago. So Illinois is down that direction. But First time yeah. Pudding's been out of a big, big body of water. Yeah, she's never... I don't think she's ever seen waves. Um, I don't think your sister brought her to any beaches. Yeah. Jello did not like the water at all. Boomer... Loved, loved water. The water. Yeah. Uh, we had to put him on a 50-foot leash because he would just swim... Out as far as he could go. Yeah. Uh, we had pretty good waves today, maybe three footish waves. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of rip, um, rip tides, rip tides, and and current activity this year. Uh, there always is to some degree, but uh, maybe a little bit more so. Um, so we we weren't planning on swimming. The water was actually cool, but very comfortable. Yeah, uh, once you got used it takes to it. A long time, time yeah. to warm up, uh, but it was pretty comfortable. And there's areas we could have gone in further, but with with pudding not not no, comfortable yeah. she actually was fine with getting her feet wet she just didn't like the waves coming at her so she would back up whenever the waves would come at her yeah the but move we moves. did get her once she was getting used to the movement of the waves a little bit we did get her kind of worked into the water for a little bit of um wading through it but she would be funny she'd get a little water up her legs and she'd go out and she'd completely shake off and like she was completely soaked but um yeah, she yeah. was. Sleeping Bear of Dunes is not that far away from us, by the way. So it's a ways north. north, but it's, it's not. North, but yeah. It's but it's it's a half day to go up there. Yeah, it's a few hours, but yeah. it's not that bad. No. Um. So there are other dunes that are closer. Well, we were basically on some dunes, but there's some taller yeah. ones. Further um, south. Further south along Indiana, and yeah. then just a little bit north also. Yeah. But there's some there's some pretty. It's all sand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're still we're just, on all sand here at our place. So. Yeah, our our sand is basically the same as the beach yeah. sand. You go six in, six yeah. inches down, and we don't have any rock or anything in it either. So. No. Um, did we have fireworks nearby, and how did Puddin do? Yeah, we have fireworks. Less than, less than usual. Yeah, well, we had a neighbor two doors down that used to set it off every Yeah, year, and then so the other neighbors have sometimes moved. done a little bit, but they were mostly gone out of town. Yeah. So not too much too close, but definitely stuff going off around the area. Um, we didn't watch it much. We went to bed early and for the night and basically it was mosquito yeah, out there. Yeah. So it, our, we have, it isn't, um, it doesn't bother her very much. No. Um, I think it, 
she doesn't get like really worried or nervous about it, but she does check in with me. So yeah. when they started going off, she would come up and just kind of ask for attention, but she wasn't shaking or anything like that. Yeah. And John um, would hide in the closet. He really, yes. he did not, he didn't go crazy, but he was pretty unhappy. Yeah. Our previous day, it was in the closet with any thunder or fireworks. And he actually, he would go in the closet as soon as he saw lightning. So he seemed to know yeah. that the thunder was coming. But, yeah. uh, yeah. He just quietly get up and go in the closet. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Sleeping Bear Dunes are beautiful. Um, so we actually ran into some people from Indiana when we were walking the beach, and they were talking about... Um, They'd never really been up on Lake no. Michigan. They're from just south of Indianapolis. Indianapolis so, a yeah. ways. Yeah. They're on a short vacation. Yeah. They're camping up this way. Mm -hmm. uh, we made the suggestion that they come back for a lighthouse tour maybe during, you know, the the fall. Well, they want to do lighthouses. Season. They said, yeah, you can do it in the fall and you can catch, you can do leaves. So, the leaf changes as well. Yeah. And you can just start north and work your way south with the leaf changing. Um, so that's awesome to do. Um, uh, my husband calls the sand on the property sugar sand. That's what we have. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, um, our previous, by the way, previous Dan didn't like thunder or fireworks or anything, but our St. Bernard would sleep through it. He didn't care. He did not care at all. We had lots of fireworks in New York. Uh, dog showed up at, or dogs showed up at friend's house a few miles down the highway Friday night. Oh, that happened last year to us. On, on. Fourth of July. Fourth of July. We, we took in a dog for the night. Yeah. Because uh, we couldn't find an owner. It was dark and it was 10 or 11 o'clock at night and there was no sign of anybody around. Yeah. So we held a dog and found the owner in the morning. Yeah. So. Yeah. Great Pyrenees dig and, and wait, my great Pyrenees dig and, dig out and take off, I think is what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Dig, but dig out. That's a cell phone uh, auto correct. Um, yeah. Oh, I do, he, this one, she will not leave my side. So, um, actually, this picture on the beach, I was holding her leash most of the time. But Multiple great Pyrenees. Out. Tracy Collins has a They're winders. Yeah. Wanderers, yeah. yeah. Uh, but she, Puddin doesn't wander. Actually, she is <laughs> halfway stretched out. I think her head, if you go that way, actually. She's can't pretty tired, it. yeah. She is stretched out. She's halfway on her bed, and her head is halfway on the tile. She's figured out that the tile does cool her off a little finally. So she is exhausted from that walk. Um, trying to see what I missed here. Rain canceled the town fireworks uh, where Tina is. Yeah, I heard that from the roads too uh, over there. So um, but Yeah, we saw their video. They said yeah. they had to delay fireworks. I didn't see their video. I think it was the hollers and the Art and Bree that I saw. That's what we're doing. So, yeah. yeah, they were with the roads for the weekend, but, um, or for the fourth. Um, shelters fill out faster on the fourth. Then. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, they get disoriented. So they take off and then they don't know where they went. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did find the owner of the dog that we, that showed up at our house last. It was a very sweet dog. That yeah, it was a really nice dog. And we yeah. didn't have a dog at that time. No. We were right, we were in between dogs. So we actually like, we oh, had let's go stuff. find the dog bowls. Yeah. And I was, oh, I think we had some rice or chicken rice or something. We had it like straight chicken or rice. We had something that was appropriate. And we're like, well, give them some of that. It's fine. And yeah. I was about to go to the store to get some food and go talk to the local vet that we use yeah. when we found the owner. And the funny thing is they said, well, if you'd gone to the vet, they would have known the dog because it was actually the same vet, same one. They would have, yeah. which, cause we were like, well, we can go talk to the vet. That's the yeah. best chance. There's a number of them around. I here. walked it in the morning before going to work so. to see if I could find like an owner walking around. The owner was supposed to leave for vacation that day, I guess. And they delayed mm -hmm. their, their leaving because the dog took off. Um, and apparently they had just lost the dog's brother a couple weeks before. So Four days, I think it was, it may have been a couple days, but it was basically that they thought the dog went looking for its brother, which his brother was missing. Yeah. Um, sweetest thing though, showed up while we we're moving the chicken. We were afraid that it was going to attack chickens. That's yeah. why we took it in at yeah. first because it was hanging out very docile, but we were in it the It completely came of... up to me and rolled over on its back asking for pets. So I'm like, okay, hello. <laughs> yeah, and it didn't bother the chickens, which was yeah. amazing. We yeah. thought it was going to, because we had the electric fence down. We were in the process of moving Move the them. fence, and the chickens were free ranging. Yeah. Uh, now we're moving them more often in the morning in the coop. 
which Cindy had been concerned about. I never, yeah. I didn't think it'd be a big problem. And we find that they move the short distances, just rolling them in the coop with the tractor yeah. or the truck is, is fine. not really causing them. They don't go crazy. Yeah. Uh, and so that's easy because you don't have to herd them around. We had one of our dogs go wandering once. Our St. Bernard in New York went wandering. But when, our, when he goes wandering, he would go to his favorite girlfriend's house, which was technically just behind our place. But if he went wandering out the front, which he did, he'd go down our road, down the busy road, and up the stairs, which she, they had a bunch of stairs up to their house, and just hung out at their house. I'm like, okay, well, I know where you're going. If you ever disappear on me, but, um, that was kind of funny, but, uh, never did that because of 4th of July. I just did that because he wanted to see Thank his you, friend. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. I don't know if we reckon, Thanks, have we yeah. seen you in the room before? I don't know. Maybe you're just hanging out and not yes. uh, chatting. Or maybe watching our other videos. Yeah. Um, so we do have some other things that we could go through since it's already 924. Yeah. Uh, we have. On our path down to the beach, we saw a few. So the beach, so one thing, the reason we took some pictures is uh, with the heavy sand beach and dunes, mm -hmm. it's a pretty unique area for the Midwest because we actually have a a desert climate. It's We get water, but it's, um, you know, it's a dune. And so you get yeah. things growing. That are different. And that you just totally wouldn't expect. Yeah. So, it's, so. so we figured we'd show you some of those. Just a few of the pictures that are really common around and here. And some of these are things that we have not featured on our channel before because we don't have them on our property. These are specific closer to the They're either water. driven through, yeah, they're either wet or wet and well-drained hey, sand. Mike, good Mike. So, yeah. Oh, I just splashed myself. <laughs> okay. So, first one. And you have a question. I'm going to come right back to down to that because yeah, we're we'll going to cover now. Yeah. Um, the first one is, for this one, do you guys know what this plant is? It's, it's not one that we featured here, but it we is. We've had ancient. it up before. I think we might have talked about it. We definitely talked about it. I don't know. We've if talked about it. Because um, Bonamigo Forging with Nobby videos. Yes. The Forging with Nobby. They have some very, very wet yes. plants. The Forging Nobby with Nobby videos have it, but we do not have it on our property. This tends to like really wet lands, but it is in the middle of the grasses. Uh, on the hill on the way down to the lake so it's not really extremely wet in this area but it does this is one of the most primitive plants yes uh in michigan yeah in the world um yeah it's so extremely old it is kind of a fun one some people uh consider this a weed if they have a very wet garden it likes to grow in it and it's really hard to get rid of unless you just out compete it but this is something called horsetail there are a few types of horsetail um but they are all medicinal. Um, I hear, I haven't used them. I hear they have properties that help protect from gin, gingivitis or treat gingivitis if you chew on it's them. It's high in... Um, A lot of minerals, I think. Yeah. A lot it, of minerals. It's the same. Metamucil can be made out of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's got some minerals and it definitely is... People make tea with it for health. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, you don't really cook and eat it. It can be kind of gritty. It always grows in sand or... So not a cattail. Yeah. Um, this that is one is starting to head and, and kind yeah. of move towards bloom, which you don't see so often. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't have that little flower head on it. It's always segmented. Technically, it doesn't flower. It spores. It's such an ancient plant no, that it doesn't, doesn't actually that. flower. So it releases its spores kind of like mushrooms do, actually. Which is kind of interesting. Zebra rush might be right, but that would be a name I'm not familiar with. I don't it know that like name, yeah. Yeah. Um, but horsetail, we call it around here. There are a few types of that. This one, next one, um, I think more people will probably know this one. This one grows. We do have this one on property a little bit, but this not one's as... a little advanced because it's in the bright, bright sun right off the water. Yeah. It was doing really well. Um, ours haven't bloomed yet, but ours are in more shady forest areas, and we don't have a heck of a lot of it, which I wish we did have more of this one. Um, Looks like a mushroom growing on the plant. Yeah, that yeah it's just kind of a little bit of, almost like an asparagus top. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yes, milkweed. That one is milkweed, and it is edible in the young shoots. However, I generally don't pick it because we don't have a lot of it on property, and it's also the only thing that the uh, um, 
monarch butterfly lays eggs on we them. We have a lot of the, monarchs. Yeah. They'll be here very soon. They're just starting to hatch. The caterpillars are just yeah. getting yeah. right there. So. so we have that. We have, yeah, Michigan Mike has it on their property. Um, what about this one? This one is was all over the dunes, mainly towards the top, a little bit drier area. Mm -hmm. Um this grows all over our property as well. So a little bit. We, we're not inundated, but we no, have... but in our areas that are more open and uh, less forested, uh, we do have this one. <laughs> Realized it was for sale one second before I said it. <laughs> oh boy. Um, now this one is, of course, you talked about the pre first picture, but yep. um, anyone, I know there's, Linda's yes, yes. Linda's got that one. Wild grape. Definitely. Don't know what type. Now the thing is, we have yeah. lots of cultivated grapes yeah. around here. Mostly, they could go mostly wild. juice, a little bit of eating, and some wine grapes. Yeah. So because of all the fruit in the area, always uncertain how wild things some are. Some of them are. Yeah, but there's yeah. a number of but, different wild varieties. But we also have a lot of wild grapes that are. Yeah. And you can eat the leaves, stuffed grape leaves. Yeah. When, when they're young. When they're young. Yeah. Uh, but big enough. Yeah. So. Blanch them. Yep. This one is one we don't. Well. We now have pro um, property, but very young variety. These are pretty. This one was off of a fairly well established, and next to it was a pretty good size. It's a tree. Yeah. Uh, and it's got a little nut Silvery forming. Silvery skin on it. Yeah. Little nut forming on there. Anybody know what this nut tree is? That is the question. It forms. There's little. If you can zoom in on that, I'm not sure if you can, but um, those nuts are have like. Right now they're fairly soft because they're really young and not full size, but have like little hairs around them that oh, will turn they're, spiky. They're, yeah, they're going to turn into a... Yeah, they're going to be spiky. Yeah. So anybody having guesses, it kind of stopped moving. Um, nope, this one is a tree, so it's not going to be a raspberry. It is not a mulberry. Um, it's definitely a nut tree. Um, any other guesses? Oh, yeah, it's a hardwood nut tree. Any, any, any. It is an edible nut. Giggles. Uh, there you chestnut, go. Chestnut. Green yeah. Gables. Got chestnut. And Brie got chestnut. Hello, Brie. Don't know what variety. We have chestnuts oh. grow pretty well around here. Yeah. I'm not sure why that one was there. I don't know if they're native. There are some American ones, but there's also some Chinese ones. But in the farmer, area. farmers, old farms would yeah. frequently have chestnuts uh, planted because they wanted them for personal yes. use or, or trade. So next one, uh, I did a feature not on this one, but on the, this is the false variety, uh, but I did this one on uh, the true variety that we have growing around here. Uh, the main difference in the looks is that the true variety has a, the berries and flowers are along the stem underneath the leaves, whereas this one is not. Our mulberries have pretty much come and gone yeah, in the done. last week or so with done. the heat. We actually have some black raspberries, which on the side of the house, I think were ripe probably today. Ripening. They were not really, they're just starting and they'll run for a, a week or yeah. long, probably a couple weeks. Gotta start picking those. Uh, but they're starting. So cherries and blueberries, the very, very beginning first ones um, hit market this week. And of course we have large commercial crops of both. Uh, in Any guesses? Area. Any guesses on this one? The true one that would have the berries along the underside of the stem would be Solomon Seal. This one with the berries at the end, and it used to have a flower, of course, at the end of the branch. This is false Solomon seal. So um, both actually have their uses. I have to look up the false Solomon seals. I just remember it came up when I was we looking up the real one. We don't find false Solomon that no. often here. We have a lot of the real Solomon. It is edible. And the root is, yeah, um, Navi likes to roast the root. Yeah, of the real one. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. pretty tasty. Yeah. Um, you don't eat the berries. No. It's for the the rhizome, basically. And you don't pull up too many roots because they're kind of slow growing. But this does, uh, a lot of people use them as ornamental plants in their gardens yeah, as I mean, well. Yeah, they're kind of nice. They um, nice there's, some, there's some cultivars that have variegated leaves and such. Next one, though, I'm thinking more people will recognize this one. This is well matured for, yeah. again, they're just beginning. So uh, intense sun. And... Mm-hmm. The sunshine and I think the more mild climate on the water edge does kind of mature things a little bit faster, a um, little different microclimate. But this one, 
So the little flowers, this is on a stem that's probably about three, mm, three or half, four three feet. feet tall. Can yeah. be, uh, can be, can five, be up to feet. four or five. Yeah. Not no, elderberry. No, it looks similar to elderberry. You're not far off. Elderberry is more spread out. They are just finishing bloom. There you go. Yep, yep. Queen Anne's. Queen Anne's lace. Linda's a hot on it hot today. Because it's got the little black dots and yeah, the two um, dots. Purple, technically. Purple, it's yeah. a purple flower in the middle of all the white flowers. It doesn't always have that purple flower in the middle, but you can... The ones around here for the most part, mm, though. Most of them, but not all of them. Yeah. Um, and the stem, and sometimes they'll have multiple flowers on the same plant, and one will have the purple flower and the others don't. Um, but the stem will also be hairy. And Queen Anne's Lace, anyone know what Queen Anne's Lace is actually as far as vegetable-wise? Um, it is a very pretty flower. It makes nice cut flowers, but if you eat There's them, a lot of little sweat bees. I don't know how big your picture is, depending on what your device yeah. is. It's hard There's to see on, on our... On our our but little there's actually three or four. So there are lots of little yeah. bees that were on it, which are good. They're not honeybees, but it, they were doing lots of work. Pollinating. Lots yeah. of pollinating there. Um, that's where Grandma pricked her finger making a quilt Maybe. as blood. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, carrot family. Yeah, breeds. it is. It is a... Oops, I didn't mean to go back to that. The hairy ones, are you? It's a wild carrot. Um, but it is not, I would say it's not a beginner foragers, uh, plant because if it has a smooth stem and does not have that purple flower in the middle, but slightly more open flower, then you could get into trouble because it's poison hemlock. Um, so you do have to make sure you know that one. I haven't really cooked with them. I know, I don't know how they cook out there. Maybe okay, but their roots, tend, okay, their, the roots tend to be small. Yeah. And they're not going to be as sweet. So as a raw item, they're not going to be very good. As a cooked item, they are roasted. Yeah. But they're not so big. So culinarily, they're difficult to work with when there's Harder. an abundance but of carrots. You can. Um, one of my foraging books was talking about how he would actually pick them when they're young, which you have to make sure you know what they are. Um, but when they're young, when the shoots are just coming up, and he'd actually pick up the shoots and chop mm. those up and cook them and use them. For carrot flavors as well hmm. so same kind of thing but with the green shoots of it uh, but prior to its flowering so you really definitely need Considering to know the price and ease of carrots i might stick with carrots regular or normal or just flavor. growing them especially carrots yeah yeah since they've been bred very nicely that do their job for the roots yeah. yeah so anyway so that's all what we saw on the trail down to the beach those are the main ones i got mm -hmm. pictures of anyway um so we just were out for feed to the a few here. hours for kind of walked walk down the beach and yeah. hung out and then yeah. came back. So we and we did have lunch nearby too. I got a picture of you on with our lunch. That was good. Yeah, so this is kind of a unique place. Um uh, it's it was in, only a mile down the road from the beach. It's in Coloma and I knew we were gonna be close and, and uh I have some product in there, but uh, there's a chef that I've met a few times, and so I'm like, well, we should go. I've been meaning to get out that way, but it's kind of out of our, it's a good way, it's out of the way to just go there. It's like um, a shop and... Yeah, it's a little marketplace. It's yeah. a, it's, um, it's in Coloma, and it's called... Um, Water and Wheat. Water and Wheat, and it is a vegan shop pantry, they call it. Yep. And so they make prepared food, things to take away, and then they have things that are on the shelf, and they have you know, some compostable, but it's... All it's vegan. all vegan. Um, Which we're not vegans, but it was really good. Food. Yeah, and they're not, and you know, they're uh, obviously they use wheat, so it's not gluten free. Mm -hmm. They have some gluten free things, but uh, you know, the chef had said to me, well, he sells our pasta. He says, look, I can't take away everything, uh, and they, so they do a lot of. Some people do a lot of vegetarian things, building up on vegetables to be vegetables. They actually do a lot of plays on things that would be meat driven and produce something that tastes similar. Yeah. that is not meat yeah but still very tasty yeah which can be good. controversial so i actually got a bacon cheeseburger because i'm like wow that's going to be the which has no bacon no ultimate. cheese no burger <laughs> yeah i'm like that's gonna be the ultimate if they can pull it off or not yeah. and it was it was very good and i would say it was um why does the best food come on paper tray? yeah a lot of it was served um, um, that way well they do um, a lot of recyclable stuff i think there too i mean but yeah and they so yeah, um, but it just yeah, worked just... well. We were eating outside too. Yeah, uh, we actually had partially some... because we had our girl with us. Pudding was still with us, and where did I have it? 
she was hanging out on the patio and she's allowed on the patio but not in a couple dogs on the patio yeah, yeah there were um she got to meet a french bulldog on the patio so that was fun yeah so we had let's see a bacon cheeseburger we had a non-yeast risen um um cinnamon roll that had yeah. a cream cheese tasting frosting. I'm not sure how they pulled that one off. Most yeah. of these things I kind of have a pretty good idea. Yeah. I don't do a lot of them, so I wouldn't be able to do them just off, you know, off the top of my head. I like his, he does a lot of vegan meat patties and sausages. They've got the texture and chew down pretty good. Yeah. Where it's, you know, maybe not like a hand patty, but if you're buying a commercial pre-pattied burger, it's not too far off of that. No. And it will brown. You can't do those to temperature. They had, you know, they had a cheese spread a melty cheese that looked and tasted pretty close to a sort of an American-y cheesy thing. Um, <laughs> and then we had some Rangoons that were filled with, I think, some chopped jackfruit, maybe some cauliflower puree. Mm -hmm. um, they were pretty good, but they had a really nice sauce with them. Yeah, that was good. They were spicy. And Cindy had a po' boy that yep. was a jackfruit-based fritters it, um, it was that almost mimicked a, like a, a crab cake. Like a crab cake, yeah. yeah. So it was mimicking um, the texture and much of the look and had some, um, had like some tartar sauce flavors of, uh, and such. Yeah. Yeah. So they're kind of a fun little place. Yeah. Um, TVP is under a lot of pressure right now. Um, textured vegetable protein, most of it's oh, soy yeah. driven. So soy, um, some people avoid soy unless it's fermented because mm -hmm. it doesn't digest well for everybody. Um, how much protein versus how much carbs and other things people sometimes are looking at that. Uh, but right now there's so much pressure on soy and many, many other plant-based items to get them into market. The big companies are jumping on, um, you know, Morningstar farms and beyond and all the rest. Um, sourcing is an issue. So they're sourcing from all over the world, like everything else. And the question is how good a pro primary product are they starting with? And is there contamination levels of, uh, you know, of pesticides, heavy metals, environmental things. So here you are possibly trying to do something that's probably trying to do something that's healthy and you're selecting uh, out of a broad array of food a very limited amount and some of the vegetarian, vegan Why would you meat do alternatives vegan, aren't get rid good. of a yeast? It's a eukaryote, so it's a single cell organism. Yeah. Um, so a lot of, so a lot of vegans that are strict will not do yeast purposefully do yeast although yeast is so natural prevalent um, but they wouldn't use yeast as a tool won't won't eat honey yeah. because it's a, a meat byproduct it's an animal but yeast byproduct. isn't animal yeah and i don't know so if they carry i don't know if they were doing that and just plants the, are <laughs> yeah well, the sort of mush, yeah so i don't yeah. know if they were doing that just to do it if they were doing it for health reasons or doing know. it for uh, people that don't want the yeast for other reasons. Uh, it actually it's not a, an animal. It was ten. It was pretty tender and flaky, similar to a. It's a fungus. Um, to a, a regular cinnamon roll. Yeah. However, the flavor without the yeastiness was more like when you do the you know the rolled up pie crust cookies with mm. you know, cinnamon sugar pie crust cookies had that flavor, but it had a a texture more like a cinnamon roll. So uh, they pulled. That's a difficult one to pull off. They just come out of the oven, so. It was good. Oh, we have one here. We have one. I forgot. I brought one back. No, it was. Uh, so you're going to show off a cinnamon roll at almost 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> they were 350. And I can tell you the recipe to technically pull it off. I'll hold it up here. Look at the screen. There you go. So you get you don't get the same browning due to without the dairy or some. There is some sugar in it, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's still pretty tender. Yeah. And again, there's no, and it's it's flaky. I don't know if we got a. So it's yeah, sort of scony or pie crusty, but I think it's more towards a traditional cinnamon roll than you think. This was three fifty, and it smells really good. I think that's a pretty pretty good deal for. He's holding that under my nose. <laughs> you can smell that cinnamon in there, but. Um... Yeah, it was good good quality cinnamon and a lot of it in there too. That's other advantage of you know proper cinnamon roll. It was good. Tense flavors. Yeah, my thought is okay on the yeast thing. If you if you're going to eat mushrooms, fungus, why would you not eat yeast? I don't understand that one. Yeah, it's in that same family. Anyway, yeah, but, uh, some people do have issues with estrogen or potential concerns about uh, estrogen mimic, uh, as you said, with soy. 
or especially when you're eating a lot of soy driven things. Uh, so that's, that is a concern. I know Although you, you eat across. a lot of soy in Asia. And well, that's almost all, all fermented, fermented, which yeah. is totally different. As soon as you ferment it, uh, the digestibility changes, the estrogen, um, you know, properties change. Here's something interesting. I don't know about um, soy estrogens, although I would think it's the same as like the clover phytoestrogens. There's been studies that show that it actually reduces the risk for breast cancer in women who are premenopausal because it competes with the natural estrogen and doesn't work as well as hmm. naturally made human estrogen. And by the way, men have estrogen too because adipose ma tissue makes estrogen. So if you want to control the estrogen amounts in your body, keep a healthy weight. If you cut fat way down, yeah, you yeah. reduce estrogen, mm -hmm. which is why people that are very heavy, men that are very heavy, start to take on some feminine characteristics because they've got more estrogen running around yeah. onto, as well as the testosterone. But um, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's besides the point. Um, <laughs> so we do need... So we had a couple questions. Uh, we had questions going back to... Uh, yeah. One pot, what was it, carbonara was it? or what? No, it was, uh, okay, hold on. Sorry, we missed that. If you could repeat, who was we'll that? Just shoot back, Michigan Mike. Michigan Mike's question about the pasta. Cutting down pots, doing a... Where was that? Sorry, I'm scrolling back. Keep going, it was a long enough post, it'll be easy to find. Yeah. Right there. There we go. Uh, rigatoni carbonara, right, with rigatoni. Cotta. Okay. But so so carbonara pancetta. is brown pork product, bacon or pancetta, traditionally pancetta, but frequently yeah. bacon is used. Um, and egg. Um, now some people do carbonara with a cream, basically an Alfredo base. I think that's totally wrong. It were I mean it's a flavor. It's but uh, I my opinion is it's it's egg based and actually has no cream in it. Interesting to add ricotta. Uh, which is dairy that's good, but um, so I'm not sure if you're doing a milk base, you know, Alfredo style base with the ricotta, or if you're doing an egg or some combination. Any event, it's a creamy driven sauce with some browned pork or carbone, carbonized pork, uh, usually black pepper and such. So the way I do that is that you need at least two pots. Um, I take a heavy bottom pot and well, I get one pot going with water, I take another heavy bottom pot dice up my pork and start rendering that to get it softened, if not cr crispy, and take out the fat. I actually use all of the fat typically. That's the flavor, uh, so there's no reason to throw it away. Helps build the sauce. If you don't want so much bacon fat, uh, use pancetta. If you don't want so much fat overall, then um, use less pork in it. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. save it for something else. Uh, so what I do is I render that first. I scramble some eggs and have it ready. If you're going to use a bechamel or alfredo sauce, I guess have that ready. Um, you'd have to make that separate. The nice thing about the eggs are you cut the pan down. Uh, you boil your pasta. And then um, when you get ready to cook your, you cook your pasta, you cook it under, uh, undercooked a little bit. Drain off all of the water or leave a little bit behind that can be stirred in. And as fast as you can pour off most of that water, you put it back in the hot pot that it was cooking in. You get the pork from the other pot or pan and the fat in there, and it should be pretty hot at that point. And you should then throw your eggs over the top that have been scrambled and start stirring it because you want the heat from the pan and the pasta and the pork to set the eggs so that they become a creamy sauce or if you don't like it so runny, uh, very lightly curded. Um, and so you keep just stirring it off the heat. She had bacon. Yeah, I do bacon most of the time. I mean, that's the American thing. Um, so yeah, you can do a saute pan or like a cast iron pan that we just wipe out with the bacon. We have a carbonara. We have a rest. Yeah, video. I mean, we have a video. Yeah. And then you can do your boiling pot with your, your pasta. And then that becomes your actual making and stirring pot. Um, the other way I do it in a restaurant is I take a steel bowl and we throw them all in and I deal and then I'll actually put the steel bowl over the boiling water and as a double oh, okay. boiler if I don't have it cooked out enough. Yeah. Uh, a good dose of Parmesan or um, or pecorino cheese in there, black pepper, sometimes parsley, uh, yeah. fresh parsley. Yeah, I think you uh, a one a one pot and a saute pan. Um, 
but you're also going to need uh, some form of a bowl or a whisk. So you're going to have with three devices, have, a fork yeah. uh, to whisk or whatever, or tongs. So because you still have to brown your meat, and then you still have to cook your pasta. So but if you're using if there. you're using a cast iron pan which we tend to keep one on the stove, you can just, once you take the fat out of that and the bacon, you can just use a paper towel or something and wipe it clean and you don't have to wash it. You just set it aside and yes, go true. back and use it the next time. So that cuts down the actual cleanup. Yeah. If you whip your eggs in a steel bowl or a ceramic bowl, you can kind of just rinse that. You know, it's a quick rinse and clean. Yeah. So. What cinnamon roll doesn't smell good? Well, obviously not a good cinnamon roll if it's, yeah. If it doesn't have enough cinnamon in it. Yeah. Cinnamon just in general There's a lot of bad good. cinnamon rolls out there. Yeah, but cinnamon smells I even had good. a bad piece of pound cake this week. Yeah. Actually threw most of it to the chickens. Um, <laughs> just wasn't made well. Uh, that's they they had made some decisions about how they make pound cake that I have serious disagreements with. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, why are we eating this? Yeah. Um, Remove the fat, yes. I don't remove the fat, actually. I want to build the fat in um, because... Oh, I was going to go to the next thing here. Sorry. Yeah, because the uh, fat is the flavor, and it's a big part of uh, introducing the flavor of the um, into the eggs. Uh, we know that animal fat one way isn't the best for us, but also if it's pasture, using it the right bad. way, it's not. yeah, it's not as bad as we realized. So using it within um, reason, but actually I would keep all of the fat and just use less meat if it seems like too much fat. Yeah. Anyway, as the chef, we got to get into frozen desserts. And oh yeah, this was tonight's meal that I got. So on this was not today. vegan. This was sort of no. the opposite. <laughs> opposite of vegan. It's lamb. It, well, it, pound cake is uh, pound cake's not that hard, but it's not the easiest thing to pull off. Because it's a mixing method, it's your ingredients, your mixing method, and of course your flavoring. And, and a true pound, a regular traditional pound cake, one pound flour, one pound butter, one pound sugar. That doesn't actually work. If you, It's close, but it, it doesn't make a great pound cake. It's slightly off, but it's a good guess. But it has all to do with your mixing and your temperatures um, to get the right crumb. And I believe that butter is the only way to do it. If margarine or oil is used, it just doesn't work. It's um, not the same well, texture. Yeah, it's not the same at all. Uh, but so, yeah, pound cake's not the hardest thing. It, it's sort of the beginning of basic baking. You learn to make pies. You learn to make basic cakes. You learn to make pound cake. But Carrie it, hasn't had supper yet. Uh, it takes a little work. It's getting late, Carrie. Uh, here's um, our... we got an extra plate of this left, pretty much, <laughs> in the fridge. You want to come up to Michigan and have some... So. Lamb, which I guess if my big fat Greek wedding, remember he was vegetarian and she offered him lamb. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Oh, lamb's not meat. No, uh, it's every day. <laughs> so lamb was local. Lamb was from Carlson Farm. Uh, friends with them. Yeah. They're at market, uh, market all the time. Not on the plate are some onions that are local that we're still cooking when I took this picture. From yes. Oh, ago. yeah. I had some. Yeah, I just... Um, roasted in the grill smoker uh, some onions they're a little larger than pearl onion yeah uh, just spring onions plate thinning they were at the market they're plate thinning onions and yeah put them out so they were good uh, yeah I just roasted those with a little oil on them a little salt and pull off the charred skins and eat the center and behind there there's some not so local mozzarella cheese and it's, tomatoes yeah. but it had the olive oil that is That's not yeah. it's a local importer but yeah. We don't grow olives in Michigan. So. Oh, and so the lamb, yeah, the lamb was ground lamb, not cube. And yeah. so it was lightly seasoned. And I did have some skewers, and I just, you know, hand uh, form it on the skewer, which is a common way to do yeah. um, skewers, and threw some uh, green pepper that had land around on the end. Now, I usually do vegetable skewers separate from meat skewers because they cook at different times, which yeah. means you burn the vegetables or the onions are raw. Um, or you know whatever they never cook the same. So I actually stuck just a few pieces of pepper. green pepper on the end um, of these because I had it. I didn't have enough. I didn't have other things doing a vegetable skewer and just to give it a little flavoring. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was dinner tonight. Part local, not completely yeah. local, but um, but it was definitely very good. And we did want to talk about. The oh, yeah, so desserts. last week we were kind of kicking around. So we talked about different cuts of ribs, not necessarily how to make ribs because there's 
lots of ways to do that. But And the hollers brought up one of the cuts that I think we mentioned. Tri-tip. Tri-tips. Did we talk about tri-tips I'm not sure. Week? I don't think We've we did. We've talked about week. before. We've talked about before. That's become a trending chef cut. Uh, it's called a secondary or chef cut. Uh, that used to be almost a throwaway or cheap, and now is not because too many people talk about it and eat it. Yeah. It's a California thing, um, which is why the hollers were talking about. It's more of a yeah. California and they barbecuing couldn't find, item. They couldn't find it for their barbecue in, in North Carolina. And actually, I think they will be able to. Um, it may be labeled different, or you have to ask for it or go to the right place. But uh, tri-tip's pretty common. You're seeing it on a lot of restaurant menus. And, yeah, it's gone way up in price. But we we kind of reference this book, uh, Frozen Desserts, from a number of years ago. Um, it's listed in our kit. Francisco down below. Magoya, who is a really really good chef, who is an instructor at the Culinary Institute of America. I don't know if he's still there. Uh, I just don't know. Um, he came after I had gone through there, but he was really top notch pastry chef uh, and did a lot of molecular and um, yeah, he was a. He was a big deal. Everybody wanted to take classes with him. So what types of desserts are in there? So I want to talk about, so frozen desserts, we don't always break down what is what. And so you can do non-dairy desserts, which are sorbet, fruit yeah. juices, granite or granita, which is French or Italian, which is basically scraped flavored ice. So that's typically fruit, uh, fruit puree, fruit juice. And uh, mostly fruit juice, yeah, and um, sometimes herbs. And you set the sugar content to a level that will allow you to freeze it, and it won't freeze completely because of the sugar or a pinch of salt in it. And you can scrape it, and it becomes a shaved or scraped there ice. There used to be a place in Indianapolis on the Pan Am Plaza that had Italian ice, which that's, I think that's was... even different. That's frozen, and they're actually shaving it. It was shaved, but it yeah. was good. So that's not as sophisticated as balancing out your sugar content mm -hmm. and allowing you to scrape it. Uh, sometimes it can use a little bit of alcohol in it uh, as a little seeds. And of course, we know that uh, alcohol does not freeze uh, well, so you can use that as one of your modifying factors to uh, make it scrapable. Frozen grape, <laughs> sweet and simple. Yeah, a lot of people do the frozen grapes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can do that. So you can do the sorbets and the granitas. And then you can move into the um, you know, sherbet, or a lot of people call it sherbert. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's used that way so much that it may not be wrong anymore, but it's technically sherbet. Um, if you spell it right. Yep. Um, so sherbet is a fruit or flavored water-based item. However, a lot of sherbets have a touch of dairy in them. And so that dairy takes the edge off the acidity, but it also helps the mouthfeel. And some of them even have some emulsifiers or gelatin in them. Um, nowadays, they would use other non-dairy things or non-animal non things because they're cost-effective and available, but put a little gelatin. In fact, that's my... If I'm even doing a, a shaved or scraped ice and I don't do it a lot and I'm a little bit concerned on a, like a wine dinner that it's going to set up properly or set up too hard and I'm going to get an ice cube and not be able to get it to flake into the cups I will put just a touch of gelatin in there also because that's a real nice way to get it to kind of break up and allow it to mm -hmm. scrape is, is a touch of gelatin it takes away from being vegan if you're looking for a vegan item but it's a good tool so sherbet watch it if you're dairy free there can be some dairy product and a sherbet but many of those are artificially flavored so they're cheap Mm -hmm. um, because you could just do color well, part and of the sugar. Reason, and... reason why it came up was Carrie had posted a video to our um, Facebook yeah. group that was the uh, the two women who make the follow the old recipes, and it was lemon sherbet. Oh, re yeah, they're calling it lemon sherbet, and it was because they used buttermilk to finish it. Yeah. And how terrible it was, and, and we are saying, well, it wouldn't be that hard to correct it. I'm, well, um, they skipped something in in the recipe. They skipped the artificial artificial sugar. artificial sugar, which I think needed needed something to correct for that. So the question is, when you take down the fat or you take the dairy out yeah. as a dessert, you need to pump the sugar real high. Um, when you take the sugar down, you have to usually pump the fat up to get the mouth feel or the freezing properties. So it's very very hard to get a health driven low calorie low sugar, low fat, 
with or without dairy. Getting all those things together in that type of frozen item is just so hard. Now there are uh, guar gum is kind of chunky and hard. Methyl cellulose and xanthan gum are going into a lot of ice creams, uh, as well as carrageenan gum. Yeah, recipe archaeology. Yeah, and carrageenan gum, xanthan. Uh, are natural substances. Methyl cellulose is yeah. derived off of natural substances. Um, they're emulsifiers, thickeners, and they create texture. And they're, you'll find them in most of your ice creams now. Most of your cheaper ice creams to mid-range ice creams will have one of those items in there because it provides a smoother mouthfeel and cut. you can cut down some of the need for um, higher cream content and also it Free, it goes through freeze-thaw cycles, shipping in your home refrigerator. It doesn't freeze as hard, uh, so you can scoop it easier. So um, it, it's saving them money, but it's kind of cutting some... Uh, That's from Tina. Just sent us a message <laughs> through Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Raised on hoagies, soft press pretzels, and water ice. That sounds like Pennsylvania. It does. All it those does. things are found. We lived in. I lived in Pittsburgh for a while. I think between Pittsburgh and Philly, you find all of those That's things really regularly. Color. So yeah, and soft pretzels are they can yeah. be addicting too. So you can do. Yeah. Um, so you can do the sherbets. You can then, uh, and they're super super cost effective because they can be totally artificial. Sorbets have to be fruit juice driven. That's why they cost more. Uh, then you can move into ice milks. Well, ice milks were a depression era thing, and you find them a little bit, but with economic changes, you just don't see a lot of that anymore because they were muted flavors. They were driven off of milk and very, very low fat, uh, which makes them really icy and kind of hard and not taste real good. Uh, but when people couldn't afford cream, okay. then it was a, a cheap way, especially in the cities, um, to sell a sort of really bad form of ice cream. Um, <laughs> You know, but it, it, that's all about cost factor. Tina says Philly born. Okay, yep. there you go. Yeah, there I was like, go. that's really Pennsylvania. Yep. Um, and ho hoagies are the common. You get hoagies for, around here. A lot. Yeah, we call them hoagies frequently here, here. but yeah. almost exclusively called it as such. And uh, there's a couple hoagie Pitt shops Pittsburgh. in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, so then you can so you can do the ice milks. Uh, interestingly, when you get into gelato, people think that it's richer than ice cream. Traditional Italian gelato is a little bit lower fat than ice cream and does not, in most states, like when we we're in New York, they do not have a legal definition for gelato. There isn't. So, and it doesn't meet the ice cream standard, ice cream standard which is a percent of dairy fat for vanilla or for an can be a little lower for chocolate because there's so much stuff in it. Mm. But I think it's 18%, something which is about half and half, half, mm. half and half cream. Uh, you have to, there, but there's a percentage. You fall under it, you're a frozen dairy product. And, milk. and that's a good way when you're looking at the store at the cheap ice cream or the cheap ice cream bars. If it says ice cream dessert, ice cream novelty, ice cream, whatever, it's meeting the butter fat for ice cream. If it says frozen dairy dessert, it it's doesn't have not. as much fat in it. Now, where you may still be okay is some of the really built up ice creams, we'll say frozen dairy dessert, because they have so much caramel and cookies and chocolate and peanut butter chunks that they fall below the uh, the dairy count because they got so much other stuff in it. But their actual surroundings may be, may be pretty close to. Uh, but yeah, so dairy dessert is a good indicator of quality. But gelato, which is considered generally, if made properly, high quality, super okay. luscious, rich, uh, creamy mouthfeel, is very slightly less dairy fat. Now, if you bring the dairy fat down a little bit, you actually taste flavors better. It's a little more intense. Mm -hmm. um, because when you get to a certain percentage of dairy fat, it's clouding your taste buds. It's filling your taste buds. And you're not able to cleanly taste through uh, flavors. Quite <laughs> big offense. Grandma, my grandma bought my brother and me some ice yeah. milk, and then she tasted it and never did that again. I mean, I remember a little bit as a kid uh, on occasion, it was phasing out. It's just economically, we're not at a point where shoot, people are buying five and six dollar Starbucks. Ice yeah. milk's not a big player. It's still out there. And again, inner city areas, old timers, you know. 
it's out there in small amounts and it's common. And I mean, I remember having some and it was never good. <laughs> so the gelato uh, on the other hand is really good when made well. Yeah. So gelato, the reason it's so creamy is the rotation is slower. So the ice crystal formation in the liquid and the water portion is much smaller, uh, even though the fat is uh, a little lower and there's less overrun. So overrun is how much air gets put into an ice cream. Um, so you have a low overrun, so you have a high density, uh, and you have smaller ice crystals, so it tastes richer. So gelato is a little lower fat and tends to be very flavorful. Um, when you get to ice cream, we have our minimums of butter fat or dairy, you know, of heavy cream in there of cream. You can go above that, and certain high-end, you know, your Ben and Jerry's or Haagen Dazs and such. Uh, frozen yogurt is an another dairy dessert. It's a cultured. Um, lower fat item and it's thickened so frozen custard cooked custard which is popular right now and frozen yogurt are low fat but full dairy and they are thickened through culture they are then heavily sweetened to take the sour edge off um, and then they are churned and frozen so yeah that's a good in between uh, and that's a real legitimate dairy dessert can be made very well or very poorly um, but yeah, that's it's good to know what those are. Uh, frozen yogurt can have a little bit of a sourness on it, which is kind of pleasant. Though I think most commercial ones, they between the cultures they select, they really try and knock it out, and then they just put enough sugar in that. Uh, but watch on those if you're like, oh, these are better for me. Watch the sugar, yeah. the fat, because we know that high fat isn't always the worst thing. The sugar is sky high, yeah. so you're actually better eating a high fat, very low sugar. Uh, you know, dairy item. If say you're diabetic, if you're lactose intolerant, well, uh, you know, and then even um, yeah, frozen custard has can be very rich, and that's that's been pretty trendy the last few years. Um, so in ice in all of these things, you watch the the fat content, but you also watch the run or the churn. So it churns at different speeds. So typically, ice cream machines in America run a little faster. There are a couple models that can do both gelato and ice cream, but very few can do. Mm each of them well. You would buy an Italian gelato maker most often. But um, so the mixing process, how much you mix it, how fast, how much air you get in is called the overrun. So the over, you start with a certain amount and when you finish the air in the lift is the overrun. Mm -hmm. So a, the difference between most of your full on ice creams between a cheap ice cream and an expensive ice cream is somewhat the ingredients a little bit the extra fat that might be in, let's say, a Ben and Jerry's or something or a Haagen Dazs, but it's mostly the overrun. So how intense, how heavy it is, because you have more content. Ice cream is one of the few things that's not sold by weight; hmm. it's sold by volume. There'll be a weight on there, but it's always, well, it's always quarts or half gallons or gallons. Or now they do what is it, the two third or five six gallons? Stupid! You don't even get you don't even get the half gallons anymore. Yeah. Um, and so. They're filling the same size container, um, but they're filling it with less material because there's more air, and you can legally do that. The ice cream trade has always been able to do that, and so you can moderate your cost. And it's interesting because a high over a good example around here regionally is Breyer's ice cream, which always is touted for years. All natural ingredients, you know, real vanilla, real fruit, no artificial colors, things like that, and that's true, and it's a pretty good tasting. Their cream level, I think, is a little bit, you know, it's right on kind of the standard level. But they have nice, clean flavors. Um, but they have a very high overrun. And that mm -hmm. makes up for being able to use high-quality cost items as a little more air. Um, then you go to something like haagen or Ben & Jerry's, which is just a brick. Because they turn it slow and not very much. And you just have a very low overrun. And you got a lot of costs involved in that. Uh, Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, those can end up being um, so heavy because of the fat that you don't clear your palate as easily. And so I think you can argue for a for a higher or lower overrun, but you're gonna you know know where you're paying for that. Yeah. Um, so that's that kind of gets you through the Kelders. The, Do we have Kelders here? Ah, it sounds slightly. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark's in Michigan. Yeah. Um, so that sounds low. My favorite is. Actually, <laughs> was um, there's only two places made it, but it's a flavor. It's the Mackinac Island Fudge ice cream, and Stucci's made it, 
But Which is Strohs, the name local. Yeah, Strohs made it. And Strohs, when Prohibition hit, stopped making beer, converted to ice cream. But I don't know if I've seen the Strohs Mac and Island Fudge ice cream recently. It's one where I think they've been actually cutting out. I found it. So um, downtown Target. Kalamazoo at um, Park Street Market, they have okay. Strohs. I found okay. it there. Because Strohs is a little bit harder to find. I like pumpkin ice cream. I know some people yeah. hate it, but I like it. Um, we, my grandmother used to make every Thanksgiving. She would take the pumpkin ice cream and put it in a pie shell and then like half melt it, put it in the pie shell, put it back in the freezer and put some whipped cream on it and we'd have pumpkin pie ice cream. Another good differentiator is what's French vanilla. Well, cheap French vanilla, they put a bunch of yellow food coloring in there. French vanilla should have egg in it. So if you have an egg allergy, mm. you shouldn't be buying French vanilla. So traditional old style Ice cream was made from creme anglaise. So creme anglaise is cooked egg and dairy and vanilla or other flavors, and it's a stirred cooked. So it's a custard. Yeah. So um, so French vanilla should be a custard, and it should have egg, and the yellow should come from the egg. Whether they put in some annatto mm -hmm. or other coloring, that's whatever. But it should mostly be colored from the egg. Um, and the... And then you can make other types of vanilla without. You have like New York vanilla, which doesn't mean anything. It mostly means food coloring. Uh, whether you have vanilla bean, which was, became big in the 80s or 90s, and there was actually some companies in New York that started doing that yeah. to show the vanilla. The intensity of vanilla can be full on or, or muted regardless of specs. Specs that aren't even always real vanilla beans. Sometimes there are other oh, things. Um, but mostly they are. So specs is a style that uh, became popular to, show, to maybe show that we we're actually using real vanilla, not artificial. Although artificial vanilla tastes basically the same. It's not the end of the world. It's much cheaper. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there is, um, so, so there's, yeah, different things to look at on dairy. And then um, other things to think about in frozen desserts is you get things like semi fredo, um, which are these things that are between custards or, or, um, other like um, panna cotta, which is a non-dairy set dessert with gelatin, but um, they're frozen. So they are semi fredo Italian is uh, half frozen. You know? <laughs> so they're very cold. Um, and, and the skill in that is putting something up that's texturally will melt and hit your palate and burst with flavor and be easy to eat. But then, um, so controlling that, that texture and controlling that temperature, getting it out onto the plate. Uh, I'm trying to think what else is. Um, there's any other kind of rare, rarer things. Um, you have foams and frozen foams, which ice cream is basically a frozen foam. Um, aerated, still frozen, non-dairy frozen, dairy-based. Yeah, I mean, I haven't used a lot of this book. I've had it for a long time. I just haven't had a lot of time. Um, but, yeah, fruit, dairy, other things. And and we just do the simple pop uh, fruit juice into the ice cube trays popsicles. Yeah, you get that, which works pretty well. Um, you can, fr of course, you can freeze carbonated beverages quickly, and you can get the carbonation in there. So people like to do fizzy grapes. Um, oh yeah. So fizzy grapes, you can put them, um, you can put them under vacuum, and then you can put them under carbonation. And you can freeze them, so it's a molecular technique, and you can basically freeze the carbonation into, into the grapes or blueberries or soft fruits. <laughs> and so when you take them from frozen and eat them, you get a little popping. Yeah, you get a little freezing. Um, this book has a lot of technicalities on different types of um, thickeners and stabilizers. So things that happen through the freeze chill is the protein, depending on how much fat and how much protein, you have an emulsion, which is a blend of of protein and fat and water and sugar and all these things behave differently and they can get crumbly or dry or, or or different things so the more you add fat the smoother it gets but you can get around the fat by using uh, gelatin and agar agar and all these gums and gels and artificial natural things so you're seeing a lot of people playing with that Thanks, Tina. so you can actually take heavy cream which is 38 40 percent cream and you can add xanthan gum which is a really nice stabilizer. It's got good freezing properties. You can use really intense fruit flavors, and then you can very lightly set that and, and just barely turn it, and you can um, 
and you can get some very intense um, creamy ice creams uh, with xanthan gum. Two other options that are you know, seeing well, over 10 years or so, you're seeing liquid nitrogen ice cream where you basically take heavy cream and you take a mixer and you pour in liquid nitrogen uh, with your, your ingredients and you hand turn it or you turn it on slowly and you get a really fast freezing of the heavy cream. I've had it. I find that the cream is so rich because and thick, you're kind of just freezing the cream. You're not getting a whole lot of aeration in, but you can make sort of an instant ice cream. Um, I've seen, uh, was it Vita Prep has an industrial one quart, a one gallon mixer that will spin so hard and so fast that you can throw ice cream, ice cubes into heavy cream. So heavy cream, 38, 40 percent. Dairy fat is about almost twice what you need for ice cream at 18%. So you can add a bunch of water in. So they'll add all the flavors in. They'll throw in um, they'll throw in ice, and it will blend so fast and so hard with the right amount of ice, you can actually form a ice cream because it doesn't have heavy crystallization. It just pulverizes everything. Mm -hmm. Now, if you keep blending, it'll heat up, and it'll, it'll yeah. melt. Uh, and then the last thing you can do is there's something called a Paco Jet, which is about... $7,000. And it basically is a rapid freezing vessel. It will, it takes very small amounts, a few ounces, rapidly freezes things, and then it scrapes and, and it'll kind of scrape off the top of this rapidly frozen stuff into a shaving that would be a lot like an ice cream. So you can make hmm. instant ice creams or instant um, For $7, sorbets. For $7,000. Well, it was very popular for a lot of restaurants. So the advantage is you can take almost anything and freeze it. You okay. can freeze it instantaneously, which means you can get amazingly intense flavor. And you have a lot of control that you, you're not losing the essences and the flavors. And you can make it in a batch, which means uh, on an ice cream station, you would make it right there. And you basically get one, two, three portions of a little scoop, a couple mm -hmm. scoops of ice cream. And it, so you would make it and serve it. And... Each, each batch, so it's individual, and you can almost cocktail customize it. Huh. So Paco Jet, you're not going to have one at home. Only some no. pretty fancy restaurants do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there's some. There's a lot more detail, but it's kind of interesting to look into what it means to freeze. Um, oh, nice pictures of Granny Tate, and they have the proper scraper. I don't know if we can. Uh, so this is a probably right. Italian or French. Over here. Um, so that's a shaved ice of sorts, and they have its little pronged scraper, sort of like an ice pick uh, yeah. chopper, and that's perfect. I just use a fork, a fork. Mm -hmm. um, we should wrap up anyway because it is 10.15, and we are over our time. Oh, and parfaits and mousses and things can Bingo. be frozen yeah. too. So that's another thing that you can do frozen mousses that are... Um, so yeah, playing with playing with temperature. So that's I just thought some of those things, we don't talk about them a lot. Or we talk about them all the time and nobody really understands the what they are. So uh, without telling you how to make them, it's good to kind of know yeah. what you're buying or, or eating. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about stuff that you can get in Missouri area um, as well. So no gelato in the house. Uh, yeah, we don't, we have, don't any, have any gelato either. No, we don't have gelato in the house. We have ice cream bars, a couple ice cream bars, which you can play, you can play with salt a lot too, sweet and salty, and do free, free bacon ice cream. Yeah, I had bacon ice cream. That was actually pretty good. It's not bad. Yeah. If I was to go to Kalamazoo, where can I find a bakery or somewhere to get clear gel, not instant? Oh, okay. So, um, I, I would call ahead, but I would talk to um, Maria at Victorian Bakery. Yep. Um, they probably do a little bit of clear. Clear gel is really everywhere. Um, I think you can probably order online. If you check Amazon or eBay, you'll find a secondary seller that can mail it. And they sell it in different size tubs, but if you need just a little bit, I don't know if, I don't really know if Victorian, I don't see her gelling a lot of things, but she's kind of one of the more traditional. And I don't think... Mackenzie's does a lot of bread. Um, they might. Who else? I'm thinking more commercial bakers do a lot of clear gel. Um, Costco sells 
fun tubs of fondant. I don't know if they sell clear, clear gel. gel and things on, um, because they use it and you know they're perfect for selling things they use. They actually keep, I assume they sell it. They keep <laughs> buckets underneath the produce and I assume they sell it. And I think there's cake decorators that come in and buy that type of stuff. So you made me look at the ingredients and calories that count on my gelato. Gelato Ouch. should be less than ice cream. For fat. Total calories should Total be. Total calories. Um, the sugar's about the same. Yeah. Roughly. So it should be a little bit less than I a good gelato should definitely be uh, somewhat less than a good ice cream, but not tremendously. Okay. Um, yeah, so clear gel, I would there is, um, but look online. I, you know, you're gonna pay extra for shipping, but you can get small amount, and it lasts for kind of forever. Um, I bought buckets of clear gel, apricot. So another way to get around clear gel, apricot glaze um, mm -hmm. is traditional in a lot of bakeries for coating pastries, and so you can buy apricot glaze, or you can buy an apricot not jam because you're left, like an apricot jelly. And so clear gel is a lot hard. You can get an apricot one that's really firm and it's going to set up super, super hard. But if you want a little stick, you use an apricot jelly. Um, you can carefully add gelatin or extra pectin because uh, pectin is what's in gel. You can add extra carefully by reheating and cooling it and you may be able to pour, you know, use it warm and brush it on as a clear gel. The nice thing, so I'm not a big fan of clear gel. It looks good, but... Um, I come from a pretty purist background that you want to, everything you use, you want to have a flavor component. You don't want to add things that aren't adding food value or flavor. So the nice thing about using apricot is it gives you this slight hint and bounce to pastries. Like, what is that? And that apricot, say, like taking a Danish and, gl and brushing it with a very light skin of the apricot yes, <coughs> is, is classic. Michigan Mike, it's always called kizu. Yeah. Um, you're right on that, or kazoo, uh, instead of Kalamazoo. Or if you went to the small school in town, it would just be K, not even kazoo. Um, so, yeah, Kalamazoo College. Uh, don't know calorie counts. Yeah. Don't allow scale in the house simply because there's, yeah. Yeah, but clear gel, go to a commercial bakeries, usually have huge tubs of it. And your you know your commercial bakery may not want to give you any but your local independent bakery that and, and you're talking you're kind of average to donut shops a lot of times will have gels and the fillings of course some of those fillings are terrible uh flavors but your independent place will gladly give you a pint or a quart container off you know their soup container of it and charge you whatever they think it's worth charging and it's probably going to be not anything major no zark have you ever heard of the kids toy kazoos the kazoos were made in kazoo. Yeah. So 29 grams of sugar isn't that much. So a yeah. teaspoon of sugar is 15 grams. That's two teaspoons of sugar. An average Coke or Pepsi has like 11 or 12 or 13 teaspoons. So in, in reference to that, 29 grams of sugar is not much. Um, 10 grams of fat also is, well, that's 90 calories. 10 grams of fat is 90 calories. Um, For the pie for filling. Oh, so yeah, a lot of people use cornstarch. It doesn't freeze well, and it comes out milky, cloudy. Uh, what I would recommend, we talked about this a couple weeks ago or last week, use tapioca starch, which used to be very hard to find. It's not hard to find anymore because of all of the gluten-free baking. Uh, look in like your Bob's Red's Mill um, gluten-free stuff and grains or whatever, those little packages that you get. I've got a couple packages laying around here. It'll cost you 5 or $6. And it'll be more tapioca starch so you know what to do with. Um, use it pretty much one for one for cornstarch. You can always throw a little extra in. It will set up absolutely clear. It freezes better. Um, it has no, fill, no flavor. It has no pastiness. Um, it needs to come near a boil, but it doesn't need to cook as hot and as long as cornstarch. So if you're doing something that's sensitive, it will, um, uh, it will set up better and faster. So... Yes, Carrie, you are right. So yeah, tapioca. So you can use tapioca pearls, fine pearls too, but they're, you're going to leave a little bit of a texture pearl in, in there. Time for bed. Yeah. It is time for bed, and I got to close the chicken coops. 
they're still open and they're back closer to the wood. So we can you do that. can with the tapioca in there. I don't know. I add the tapioca into like a cherry pie at the point of I can my cherries in low sugar um, and in liquid. And then I pour off some of the liquid and I set up the pies with the tapioca at the point that I'm that I make it because yeah. I don't want it set up. In I don't can. know the recooking properties of tapioca. Some things break down uh, in the longer cooking times. I don't know how that would work. Mm -hmm. Unless you're telling me that tapioca cooks well, and then you know that. Because I have never done it. But I add it in, and it does great for, for pies and thickening many things. Yep. No flavor, no color, clear. So. Okay, guys. We should absolutely uh, wrap this up a little bit, um, and we will be back next week. I can give you the one last. Yeah, Cold Stone. I've actually never been to a Cold Stone. Cold Stone Creamery. After I man, been to. so many of them around, I've just kind of what they do. The I believe they do the scraped. So they basically have an ice cream base, whatever's in their proprietary base, um, and they're taking a super chilled stone, which is um, not you know very cold surface. Pastry chefs use them for things, and they're they're letting it. Um, so they're mixing in their flavors and doing their little silly show and charging you a lot for that. Uh, while it the dairy base is pretty much setting without additional aeration or minimal aeration on that tabletop. That is in comparison to the Chinese scraped ice cream or Korean. I think it's Chinese, uh, where they use a similar type of cold top. They pour out their base. They let it set up harder. Um, and then they actually scrape it with a palette and they get curls and then they nicely set all the curls in a bowl and sometimes garnish to make these really fancy desserts. So there you have no overrun. Uh, so you have this intensity of whatever base you're using. And um, yeah. Michigan Mike, are you seeing our mosquito fly around? We do have a mosquito that keeps flying around. We have, yeah, the mosquitoes have been absolutely vicious sneak, this week. Sneak in sometimes. But, um, yeah. Okay. So, I think yeah. that is the last question that we're taking right now. Will, if you have of any other questions, we can come back to it next week, write them down or send them to us on the uh, Facebook yeah. group. We'll come back to it, but we will be back here next week, 9 PM Eastern standard time. Um, and yeah, so I guess it's a normal week again. So no holidays this week, just a lot of hot weather. So we will see you next week everybody good night good night